And good morning to everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you this morning. Um, as Drina has said, uh, I was asked to speak with you this morning uh, on the process of democratic transitions and security in Africa. And so I've organized my remarks here into three parts. First, um, just to take a snapshot of the relationship between democracy and, and conflict, uh, or more generally governance and uh, security in Africa. Then to uh, look at uh, some of the ov overall status of uh, democratization on the continent, and then look at some of the challenges of, de of democratic transitions. So to begin, I um, thought it'd be useful um, for us to look at the map of conflict uh, on the continent. So if you look on the right hand uh, part of the graphic, you see the 12 countries that are currently in conflict on the continent. And of those 12, 10 of them are autocracies. Um, and in fact, uh, three quarters of the countries that are fragile states in Africa are also um, autocracies. You can compare that with the panel on, the, on your left, which is Freedom House's um, uh, map of freedom in Africa. Uh, and the red countries are the countries considered not free or, or autocratic. And, and you can see just regionally and graphically the uh, degree to which um, there's considerable overlap between areas of conflict and, and, and areas of, uh, of autocracy. And indeed, this comes out in some of the statistical work that is done. Um, the Political Instability Task Force in reviewing um, countries that have failed um, since 1955 found that uh, of the 75 variables that they looked at, that democracy was one of the three best predictors of stability um, that they had. The other two were uh, levels of well-being, as measured by infant mortality rates, and trade. So democracy uh, is seen as a stabilizing influence. Uh, we also see this in terms of successful counterinsurgency operations. Uh, RAND did a, a, a big review of all counterinsurgency operations, again, I think since the 1950s. And uh, <clears throat> of all of those cases they looked at, they came up with a list of factors that influenced the greater tendency for successful counterinsurgency versus less successful. And the, the top factor for successful counterinsurgency was legitimacy of the government. And so when that government's leg legitimate, there's uh, um, uh, a lot of factors that contribute to greater stability, mainly that uh, it can lessen um, grievances and there are, uh, th there's less resonance to um, the narratives of uh, insurgents uh, that are, are claiming that the government doesn't represent the people, that the government is uh, uh, predatory explo or exploitative, um, et cetera. Um, we also see that um, autocracies in Africa since 1990 um, have tended to be in conflict at a higher rate than other governance systems. So um, if you just total all the the years um, by regimes, we see that uh, autocracies have been in conflict about one year out of four uh, in total. And this also plays into what is known as the conflict trap, that once uh, a country is in conflict, it's hard to get out of conflict. And even if there is um, a peace settlement, um, in 50% of the cases, that country lapses back into conflict within five years. Uh, a good example of that is South Sudan, which um, had its long-running conflict uh, for secession with uh, Sudan. It gained independence. It had a period of, uh, of uh, relative calm, um, but then uh, because it was not able to mobilize uh, 
political structures that were going to be uh, um, stable for uh, its, its own population, uh, it, it lapsed back into conflict and is currently um, spiraling uh, into greater uh, levels of instability. So this instability <laughs> plays out in different ways. Uh, here is a, a map of um, the top 10 countries uh, with population displacements in Africa. Um, and here we've got IDPs, uh, internally displaced people and uh, refugees. And uh, what we see is that, again, 90% uh, of all uh, displaced people on the continent originate in from uh, you know, autocratically governed countries. And uh, the top three generator of displaced people today are um, Sudan, South Sudan, and Democratic Republic of Congo, which combined, those three countries, um, have uh, led to the displacement of over 10.5 uh, million people. All right, inversely, uh, de democracies tend to be more stable. There's the well-known concept of the democratic peace, that democracies uh, for uh, many years um, have have tended not to fight one another. And most of that literature is looking at uh, interstate conflict. But uh, they find that it applies generally for intrastate conflict as well. Democracies tend to be more peaceful. They tend to be more stable uh, overall. Um, and there are a number of reasons for that, um, which we can get into. but. You know, the legitimacy factor, the tendency to try to abide by the rule of law, transparency, um, a culture of negotiation, trying to find fair resolutions to grievances, you know, incentives to try to um, be inclusive and think about the interest of uh, various parts of the population. All these things uh, contribute to more stable outcomes and, and resolving conflicts non-violently when they emerge. And again, this plays out statistically in Africa. Africa's democracies um, have uh, about a 1% uh, probability of being in conflict um, uh, over uh, any three to five year time period um, as compared to the 25% level that I had referred to earlier for autocracies. Now, this is particularly relevant in Africa because as you've heard in other sessions, um, the vast majority of conflict in Africa is internal. And so it is responding to governance failures of some type or another. Um, and these, are, these may be grievances, this may be a um, sense of marginalization or exclusion from political process, it may be a sense of uh, disparities, uh, you know, um, in unequal access to resources, um, it may be you know, predatory actions on the, on the part of the government, uh, but governance plays a, a very direct role in many of Africa's conflicts. Um, in fact, uh, um, one aspect of this that, that shows up very strongly is the relationship between corruption and instability, that um, Countries that have relatively better controls of corruption or are, are seen to be less corrupt are much more stable than countries that aren't. Um, that's really just a proxy for a host of other governance uh, features where um, the perception of the population that the government cares, the government's going to be responsive to their interest, that they have the right of appeal, if they think that something's not right, that they believe in the justice system, all those factors contribute to stability. And if, if they don't exist, and people are facing despair, they don't feel there are any other options, that's what creates the seeds of discord, the, the seeds um, that feed uh, violent resistance, um, and that which can contribute to conflict in, in Africa. And we looked at the maps regionally. Um, 
but really a lot of the conflict in Africa starts at the local level. It's one part uh, of uh, South Sudan or, or, or Sudan or Democratic Republic of Congo that is feeling marginalized, uh, that is feeling uh, exploited, um, that is feeling excluded or disenfranchised. And um, <coughs> when that is stirred up by uh, spoilers, you know, uh, uh, rebel leaders who uh, want to try to take advantage of those grievances for their own political ends, uh, then that is what uh, takes a country into conflict. You should those is a, at the local level. So when we talk about governance, we need to think about it not just at the national level, but at the regional and, and local levels as well uh, in Africa. And this um, relationship between governance and instability um, is reflected in uh, the perceptions of security sector actors on the continent. So we just uh, have completed a survey of 750 um, African security sector professionals and includes the military, police, gendarmerie across the continent. And one of the interesting things we found was marked differences in the perceived risk of political crisis by the security sector professionals, depending on what regime type they were uh, working in. And so on the graph here, we see that on the left, the left three bars um, represent the responses from the security actors within democracies. And there, they saw the risk of political crisis as being very low, less than 10% saw that as a serious risk. About 30% saw it as a medium risk, and about 55% saw it as a low risk. We flip over to the right side, uh, looking at the responses from the autocracies, and it's almost the mere opposite. That in that case, um, over 40% saw the risk of political crisis as high. Um, about 30% saw it as a medium risk, and only 25% saw it as a low risk. Um, yes? So is this information Africa-specific, or is that globally? No, it's Africa-specific. Okay, thank you. That's, our own uh, owned research, so uh, so, um, and it, it, the same pattern holds for civil unrest. We had asked questions about civil unrest, and again, democracies are less, much less concerned about that in the, uh, among the security sector actors. Autocracies are very uh, unsettled by the risk of uh, civil unrest. So, um, I think the key point here that I, I want to make is that when we talk about conflict or insecurity in Africa, we have to talk about governance. It's usually at the center of so much of the, um, of the stability discussion on the continent. So let's turn to talk about the state of democracy in Africa. And I think it's important to put it in context. Um, uh, the move towards democracy in Africa um, really we can say began at the end of the Cold War um, when the um, different global forces, the different superpowers were decoupled to a large extent and there became opportunity for pluralism. In the early 90s we saw uh, the advent of multipartyism uh, across the continent. And so we've seen uh, some significant changes since then. Yeah, as you can see on the left side of the graph here, um, at the beginning of the 1990s, almost all countries were autocracies. The um, dark line there at the top. Um, very few countries were, um, had any pluralistic uh, political process at the bottom. But over the last couple of decades, that's changed. And what we've seen is a slow growth in the number of democracies, um, a gradual decline in the number of autocracies, and in, in uh, in, in the process, um, a significant uh, upsurge in the number of mixed regimes or inter intermediate uh, governance systems. And that 
category, that very broad category, um, captures more countries in Africa today than any other. So when we talk about governance in Africa, I think we need to recognize there's big variance. And most of the countries are somewhere in between in terms uh, of their journey. And so we're, talk we're talking about countries like Burkina Faso, Mali, Tanzania, and most recently Gambia, which just this January was able to oust its leader, Yawa Jame, after 22 years in power, uh, and regain uh, its uh, foothold on a democratic trajectory. Um, and so it now has uh, rejoined uh, that, that path. And when we think about democracy, I think it's important to just reinforce, you know, it's more than elections. So just about every country in Africa today has elections. That's one of the changes that we've seen. But the quality of those elections vary greatly. And so it's important to recognize that. Uh, not all of them are free and fair. Uh, and, you know, uh, there are, um, you know, authoritarian or what we call semi-authoritarian leaders who become much more clever in giving the outward impressions that there are some democratic processes, but all the while really retaining a monopoly on power themselves. There isn't any doubt about how those elections are going to turn out, who has access to media is controlled, spaces for political participation are limited. Um, and so we need to be sophisticated in terms of how we think about the, the state of these different uh, governance systems. Uh, and to realize that you know democracy, more than just elections, more than just getting rid of a bad leader, as we talked about in, in Gambia, it's about building positive institutions. You know, it's about building fair electoral management bodies. It's about having a free press. It's about having checks and balances on uh, the chief executive. This is particularly important in Africa because there's a history of what we call big man uh, political processes where uh, a single leader rules in a very personalistic uh, governance style where he is able to define uh, the rule of law and he can then apply that in an ad hoc way that benefits his um, uh, you know, his allies, uh, which, um, you know, maybe his political party, maybe his ethnic group, uh, uh, maybe his business interest. And that exclusive governance arrangement um, is what helps keep him in power, but it also is what prevents the establishment of the rule of law, of uh, merit-based systems of government government within the civil service uh, that prevents sort of a fair uh, competition in the private sector so that businesses can get access to credit and property uh, and, uh, and investment opportunities. So all these things impinge on the development of, uh, of democratic systems uh, in government. You know, democracy is also more than just about winning elections. It's about um, maintaining, respecting the rights of all people, uh, even for those who lose an election. And, uh, and so this is a, uh, it's an important issue that is still being absorbed in many African countries that just because you win doesn't mean you have absolute power. Uh, and, you know, minorities, uh, still have basic political rights, civil liberties that should be respected regardless of who's in power. Um, that shouldn't affect their opportunities for educational advancement or jobs, or travel, or other, other things. So these are the challenges that um, Africa is facing as it tries to move up this path towards democracy. It's that uh, institutionalization process uh, that create these systems of fairness and accountability um, that will uh, um, allow it to achieve more stability. And in fact, there's been considerable progress uh, over the last couple of decades. We do see stronger institutions 
by and large, across the continent. There are more elections, as I said. There are more fair elections. Elected electoral management bodies have improved. They've become more independent. Um, there's greater access to information. And with information uh, communications technology, um, it's easier to monitor things and easier to report. It's, har it's harder to steal elections um, uh, easily. Uh, um, uh, there's more civil society uh, actors uh, out there, uh, and you know there's relatively more independent parliaments. Uh, and the court systems have become more capable. Again, it's varied, but there's been progress. I think we need to recognize that. Um, at the same time, there's pushback. None of this uh, has you know is easy, and there's. Uh, you know, there, there are countervailing uh, influences, um, governments, you know, governmental leaders who want to retain power at all cost are doing their best to constrain space for civil society. They're putting pressure on media. Um, there are violent extremist groups who are uh, trying to stir up discontent uh, with narratives, with negative narratives of the government. And they're using information communications technology as well to try to get their message out. Um, there are uh, illicit groups, narcotics traffickers, or, or other um, uh, criminal organizations that um, are taking advantage of Africa's poorest borders for their businesses. Uh, they have vested interest in keeping people in power who are going to look the other way. And so there's a co-option process that, uh, that goes on and that um, uh, also inhibits uh, uh, democratic development. In fact, um, we just today released a new research paper on um, on criminality in Africa's fishery sector. And what we, we find is that um, collusion between uh, often foreign fishing companies who want to exploit Africa's uh, rich fish stocks uh, with the African officials responsible for overseeing those uh, sectors is a key impediment to building up the, um, the surveillance and prosecutorial capacity within Africa to, um, you know, to, control its, to control its borders, to control its waters, to control these resources. And so there are all these countervailing in, in, interests. You know, there are other global actors as well. Uh, and you know, China comes up regularly in this regard where you know, China's interest in Africa, while arguably are varied, have, have focused a lot on natural resource um, access. And uh, this is often done in a top-down manner. And if, um, if there's uh, opportunity to, you know, if, if there's access to um, the different natural resource uh, resources that uh, the, the China's interested in uh, through uh, agreements that it's able to negotiate with government leaders, China's going to want to keep those people in place. And so we see uh, all sorts of resources that um, flow to help sustain these um, governance structures. So the challenge for Africa and its democratization effort is to build stronger institutions. Um, so putting a finer light on this, as I said, the vast majority of Africa's governments currently are in this uh, middle category of countries, what we call democratizers. You also have the semi-authoritarians. And uh, in fact, there are 23 of Africa's 54 countries are in that um, second column. Countries that have made some steps towards building up these institutions, but they're not complete. 
uh, and so they're still uh, on the path. And um, experience has shown, and this isn't just in Africa, but we see it particularly strongly in Africa, that democratic transitions in Africa are challenging. 65% uh, of the countries that start a democratic transition have at least one period of backsliding. Uh, usually that happens within the first five years of a transition. And so thinking back again to the Gambia case, you know, people are very excited. That they're, they're, they're finally free of their longtime dictator. But uh, the challenges are really in many ways ahead of them because they've, you know, they're going to face other forces of instability um, that are going to try to derail the process of democratization. Uh, and these come in many forms. Uh, usually it's a backlash against the institutional structures that have been in place. So democ you know, democratic uh, transitions um, don't begin on a, on a level playing field. They often begin in a very difficult place where there's been a lot of corruption, where there's been patronage, where you know, those who are in control of ministries or private sector enterprises have been tied to the old regime. And so it isn't just a matter of replacing that leader, but creating new institutions that are going to be more even-handed, they're going to be more transparent, they're going to facilitate uh, um, uh, more widespread access to state resources. And the folks who've been benefiting under the old system don't usually just roll over and let that happen. So there's going to be pushback uh, against that. And that is often why these transitions um, uh, get stalled or get pushed back. Um, sometimes newly elected democratic leaders um, uh, you know, are, you know, fall under the allure of the power that they face. Um, especially in, in places that they don't have the checks and balances that are going to prevent that. Um, and, uh, and so this is why the democratic transition process often takes um, some time. Uh, and indeed, we're talking about a decades-long process, typically. Uh, yet, interestingly, the democratic uh, trajectory tends to be resilient. So of those countries that backslide at some point, we find that about 65% of them actually resume a positive democratic trajectory, usually within three years uh, after some backsliding. A case in point here is Mali. So Mali had been on a democratic path. It had a coup uh, in 2012. Um, you know, and so they sort of crashed backwards. And then through a period of you know, two years of negotiation, they were able to then reestablish democratic elections. The military government that had taken over was uh, forced out. And now they have resumed their democratic path. Um, still imperfect, but it is uh, uh, at least moving forward in that way. And so when we think about democratic transitions, it's important to not assume they're static or they're, or they're linear. They're not always going up, and, and nor are they going down. Uh, so when things go backward, it doesn't mean that's the end of the game. Things uh, do reverse. And there are these constant pressures in both directions that um, countries in every, of the, every, every one of these categories faces. And so it really is in this tumultuous period that we're seeing this battle of governance norms. You know, what, what are the norms going to be in Africa? Um, and how, you know, how, how, what is the threshold for democratic uh, governance going to be? And that's what's being played out right now. Um, <clears throat> so when we talk about building stronger democratic institutions, uh, to strengthen these uh, democratic transitions. Um, we're talking about really building institutions of accountability. Again, when we recognize that the starting point in many African governance structures is a um, unfettered leader 
they, they, you know, the, as I mentioned, they, it's, it's called the big man syndrome or a neo-patrimonial uh, political process. Um, the, the challenge is how do you create guardrails around this leader so that he um, is unable to just uh, make policy on his own, that there has to be consultation, that there are checks and balances, he has to operate within the realm of, the, of law. And this little schematic gives a, a simple uh, reflection of what has to evolve. And here you have the executive in the middle, but in the inner ring you have the formal state structures of, of um, a judiciary, of a parliament, um, your local government processes, your civil service, which I would include you know, security sector actors. Then you have an outer ring of informal, non-state actors like uh, civil society, the media, the degree of social cohesion in a society, your private sector, and external norms, regional norms, international norms, uh, which um, uh, also have influence on these outcomes. Uh, a particularly um, important check and balance in Africa that I wanted to emphasize is the, uh, is the process of setting term limits. So as many of you may know, Africa has a problem of when somebody's in power, uh, they can stay in power for many years. In fact, uh, uh, at last count, I think 18 African leaders have been in power for more than 20 years. Uh, and so the process of instituting term limits uh, is important for establishing the norm of succession, that somebody isn't in power for life and that, uh, that there is genuine competition for power at, you know, at, a per at every four to five year time period um, so that succession can happen in a stable, predictable manner. And so there's been a big push over the last uh, two decades to try to create term limits in Africa with mixed results. And this map is just meant to give you a simple uh, illustration of the variance that there is out there. The red, the countries in red in the middle, largely, um, are countries that they had established term limits, but the, then the leader was able to evade them. So they no longer have term limits. Uh, the countries in green, both the, the light green and then the, um, the blue green color there, uh, uh, have term limits. Uh, and what we find is interestingly, for countries that uh, they've evaded term limits, leaders on average have been in power for 21 years. For countries where there are term limits, leaders have been, in, it, have been in power on average three and a half years. And so it makes a big difference for this process of democratic transition to create term limits and then therefore the expectation that there's gonna be uh, democratic change. And of course this contributes to stability because if you lose an election, it doesn't mean you're out for decades. You have a chance to contest again um, in, uh, in a couple of years. Um, and let me just add a few words on the security sector and, and this uh, institution building process. The security sector, while it's not seen as a political institution and, and it shouldn't be, it often has been politicized in Africa and indeed as part of the um, patronage network that autocratic leaders um, construct to stay in power, they usually need some dimension of the security sector to support them. That provides them the course of capacity to, um, uh, you know, to control outcomes, to limit uh, other political actors. And so the political, the, the, the military and, and other security actors in Africa um, are often faced with the choice of how um, closely they're going to um, be with, with the ruling party. 
Um, and um, and this process of creating uh, stronger democratic institutions for the security sector comes down to creating more professionalism. That there's a separation between the politics and um, and the um, functional aspects of what the security sector is there to do to provide security for the for the state, not just for the regime, to protect borders, to protect citizens. All those issues need to be uh, established for Africa's security sector to evolve and um, support these transitions. Um, and interestingly, in the survey I referred to a little while ago, where we had recently surveyed uh, 750 um, African security sector professionals, we saw, we saw some interesting results with regards to their perceptions um, on issues of professionalism. And 88% of the security sector respondents uh, indicated that corruption, governance corruption, was the single greatest threat to security that, that they faced. Um, and um, many of them indicated that they didn't think that they were prepared to, to deal with that. They didn't know how to control corruption within their services. Um, this was the factor more than any other that was seen as contributing to insecurity. So this was the, the top security threat that most security sector actors uh, identified was corruption. You know, it wasn't piracy, it wasn't uh, violent extremist groups, it wasn't a neighboring state, it was corruption within their own government. Um, and similarly, while many of the security actors identified a whole host of uh, values that they felt represent was, were represented in their service, like duty, um, professionalism, honesty, um, uh, when it came to merit-based service, we didn't get uh, a majority of any service responding that that reflected their uh, institution. And so the sense that they're operating in a non-merit-based system is, I think, extremely corrosive and, um, uh, and destabilizing. And so as we talk about how does the security sector contribute, I think it's how does it contribute to democratic transitions, it's a matter of building these institutions that create more professionalism, more, more, more merit-based uh, activities, more transparency, uh, a greater sense of service to the population rather than to the, to the regimes. So to recap, you know, governance is central to uh, security and conflict in Africa, uh, legitimacy matters, and um, <clears throat> um, w while Africa is in this period of transition, um, and there is this period of fluctuation going on, uh, it is the process of strengthening institutions that really matters and that we should be focused on. And as we engage uh, with African uh, governments, uh, we should keep in mind the state of its institutional development as ways that we can contribute both to better governance, but also to uh, more uh, stable realities on the continent. So with that, let me wrap up and then happy to follow on the conversation. So thank you.